All right, so our second lecture uh, for uh, module one, and uh, this one's on the menu. And uh, what I want you to think about before I go to the next slide is uh, what does the menu affect? Okay, let's just say that we uh, go ahead and we create a menu. Um, what does that do to our operation? What, what decisions on the menu affect decisions in the operation? And, and I hope that you're thinking about a bunch of stuff. I hope you're thinking about, gosh, you know, the, the menu is going to go ahead and determine what we have to order, uh, what kind of equipment we have, all of those things. And if you look, if you think about it, the menu affects everything. The menu is the uh, catalyst of our concept. The menu should reflect our concept. People should look at the menu and have a great idea of the uh, the ambience of our operation, the, uh, the, the price points, the, the quality of service, the quality of food, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the type of seating, uh, 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 everything. So when uh, you think about uh, the menu, the menu drives every decision in the food service operation is the easiest way to say it. And this is just a list of, uh, of, of uh, uh, some, uh, but not all. And uh, I'm not going to go through them uh, line by line. Uh, you can go back and, uh, and write these down. Um, <clears throat> so let's talk about uh, uh, different types of menus. Uh, I'm just going to tell you, but, but I'm gonna, instead of trying to say that uh, table de doti or table de hotel or whatever it is, I'm just going to talk about prefix menus. Prefix menus are menus where uh, you don't have options. So uh, you have an appetizer, you have an entree, and you have a dessert. Sometimes the prefix menus will give you a choice of entrees. So uh, uh, you may be a five course prefix menu and uh, you get to choose between a soup or a salad. And then you get to choose between a, a chicken, a, a fish, or a, 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 a beef uh, dish. Um, but a lot of times you don't even have those options. It's prefixed and, and you either order that or you order something else. And then we have a la carte, and that's where you buy everything independently. Steakhouses are, uh, are, are great examples of a la carte. So are fast food restaurants if you take away the meal deals. You know, when you go to a fast food restaurant, you can order a burger, you can order a, a, a side, you know, fries, and then you can order your drink. Um, or you can uh, not order anything. So a, a combination menu is going to have uh, more than one. And then a California menu actually... Uh, it looks like a different font there, the California. Actually, uh, uh, is where you have uh, uh, all of your meals, breakfast, lunch, and dinner served all day. So uh, IHOP is a California menu, or Waffle House, or now even Sonic has a California menu. Um, and then we have different types of support menus, and, and uh, we've got the children's menus. Uh, there, there was a trend where we had teen menus. I don't see that. But we do have senior menus, or early bird menus. And then we have beverage menus, and it could be alcoholic and wine. It could be a smoothie menu, depending on the operation. Uh, it could be a slushy menu uh, if, uh, if we're a, a, a Sonic-type operation. Other businesses will have uh, a, a separate dessert menu. Or uh, if we think about um, uh, hotels, they may have a limited room service menu. Um, some restaurants don't feel that their food, some of their food travels well, so their takeout menu might be different from their, uh, their dine-in menu. And then uh, we have the other three, the banquet, the California, and the ethnic. Uh, some restaurants will have themes, ethnic themes, and they'll have an ethnic menu. But then there's even ethnic restaurants that have healthy menus. So we could even have like uh, P.F. Chang's has their, uh, their gluten-free or low-gluten or whatever it is menu uh, that they're offering. All right, so the, the thing that we have to do is we have to go ahead and dif differentiate ourselves from others. And, and one way that we do this is to, uh, to have a signature item. And it shouldn't say the goal is to be the signature restaurant. It should, it's, it's a goal to, to have a signature uh, item or dish or theme or whatever it may be. So uh, when you develop your concept, I want you to think about what your signature is. What's, what's the stamp that uh, when, when people think of you, they talk about? Uh, as an example, uh, uh, John Currents uh, on his, uh, at his, uh, 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 gosh, I can't remember, his, his fine dining restaurant, uh, uh, grocery, uh, anyway, I can't remember the name of it, I don't know why. You know, shrimp and grits never leave that menu. 
So that's the staple of him. That's pretty much his signature dish at that restaurant. Um, if we were to look at uh, Dick's Last Resort, uh, you know, them being rude is their signature item. If any of y'all have ever been to uh, 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 Lambert's uh, Cafe where they have the throne rolls, the, the rolls are their signature item. If we were to look at Zaxby's or, uh, or, or, or Cane's, you know, that they're, they're, they have signature sauces. So the signature item could be a sauce, it could be service, it could be a beverage, it could be a dish, it could be anything. But I want you all to think about when you develop your concept, what's, what's your signature? What, what's the item that, what's the, what's the attribute of your restaurant that you want everybody to talk about and to think about first when they, when they think about your operation? All right, now we have different types of menus. And if you look, uh, uh, there's some common menus here where we've got uh, two-sided and three-sided menus, and we've got... Uh, 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 one page uh, menus, you know, menus can be laminated, they can be, uh, uh, they could be uh, hard paper, soft paper, they could be virtual. Uh, every, even the, the physical uh, attributes of our menu are going to go ahead and uh, tell people about our operation. If we have a leather bound menu, we're not going to be limited service uh, or, or casual theme, we're going to be fine dining. So the, uh, the, 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 the layout of our menu, the, uh, the, 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 the materials of our menu are, again, still painting a picture of who we are. All right, so if we were to look at these menus, what happens is uh, there have been studies where they do uh, Gantt charts and they see uh, where our eyes go first. And uh, based on these studies, if we've got a one-page menu, the prime real estate, that's where our eyes focus first and foremost, is at the top center. And that's where we want to go ahead and put those items that we want our guests to purchase. They could be uh, our signature items. They could be uh, our most profitable items. They could be the items that we feel uh, are the, bring the best value to the guests and, uh, and, and are the, the most efficient for us to produce. Um, but every menu, and here's three examples of where that prime real estate is, and we need to use that prime real estate uh, just as uh, marketers do to uh, promote those items that we want to sell the most. Okay, so some mistakes. Menus being small, too small, fonts being too small. What, what, what frustrates me now that I'm getting older is when I go into a restaurant that's very dim and the menu uh, writing is very small and I have challenges reading it. And if I have challenges at 53 years old reading a, a menu, then I know my dad would not want to go to that restaurant or. Uh, or, my, or, or people who uh, are, are my age or older because it's, it's frustrating to uh, not have a menu or a restaurant designed to cater towards their target market. So we want to make sure that if we, uh, our font size, uh, our lighting in our restaurant, uh, our font style, mm -hmm. all are consistent with not only our concept, but, but, but attract those that we want to attract. Um, so uh, we need to do so. We, we should treat all menu items as the same because uh, some menu items are extremely profitable. Some menu items are, uh, are extremely expensive. And, and uh, we could push people away if we focus on the most expensive items and, uh, and uh, we're in a, a, a price conscious market. And by the same token, uh, if we go ahead and we uh, have the kids menu having equal weight to uh, the adult menu, we're in a situation where if we're not focusing on families, uh, we're going to push the, the non-family members away. Um, so we've got a lot of things that we need to go ahead and make sure uh, of our menus. One is, are we going to create our own menu? Are we going to go ahead and have a professional do it for us? Are we going to use inserts so that we can change parts of our menu uh, 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 on a daily or weekly basis? Um, are we uh, going to benchmark our menu against others and, uh, and maintain a three-month supply? Or are we going to go ahead and uh, uh, change our menu with uh, the seasons or even with the days uh, based on the ingredients we get? There are restaurants that actually print their menu up every morning based on what they get as far as products because they're using locally sourced products. So there's a lot of uh, mistakes that we can have as far as uh, uh, not doing those things or, or not being those people or wanting to be those people and... and, and uh, and, and operating in a different way. All right, so now we have uh, trends in menus. Virtual menus are huge as far as tablet menus. Uh, 
I like it where the server comes to the table and takes the original order with the regular menu, with just the standard menu, and then they leave the iPad or the tablet menu on the table so uh, uh, we as guests can continue to order. It's great for drinks and it's great for uh, appetizers and desserts because what happens is if we're staring at all these desserts on the tablet and they all look so good, we may order one before we get our appetizers and our entrees. So uh, our minds are, are, our imaginations are bigger than our stomachs. So we may actually order a dessert not knowing that we're not going to be able to uh, enjoy or, or eat the dessert uh, early on. And as far as drinks, uh, if, if we make impulsive decisions on getting drinks, we're going to order more drinks than if we have to wait and think about it until the server comes back around. And uh, as far as the menu apps, I don't use them, but uh, I know that uh, every time I'm, I'm at a limited service restaurant, somebody's using their app, and uh, I bet you they're really effective. Uh, and I hope that, that you all are taking advantage of them. And then bundling. Uh, you know, I talked about those meal deals at fast food restaurants. That's a perfect example of bundling. You know, instead of ordering uh, uh, our drink, uh, uh, our fries, and our, our sandwich independently, they give us one price for all three. It, it takes away the thought process of do we really want fries or do we don't want fries. And now they even have that supersize stuff. So for an additional couple bucks or additional buck, we can go ahead and get an extra large fry and an extra large drink. And, uh, and uh, it really uh, brings perceived value to the guests. So if it's in fast food, uh, it's everywhere. You know, uh, uh, we can go ahead and get soup and salad options at McAllister's. Uh, there's meat, there's lunch specials everywhere. And all of those things are put together to uh, maximize uh, revenue and hopefully profitability and uh, actually bring value to the guests. So it's a it's a win win. You know, we go ahead as a as an operator, get uh, uh, people to order uh, multiple items. And as a guest, uh, they get a price that's uh, better than if they ordered them individually. And uh, sometimes we do use the bundles, though, to get people in the doors, and then we hope to uh, switch them to something else. And, and the f higher up we are in the dining scale, so fine dining is an example. Ruth Chris has like a $39 three-meal deal. They don't tell you about that when you walk in the door. They would rather you order from their a la carte menu. But if you mention it to them, they'll bring you that menu. So that menu may bring you in the door, but their goal is, is to do kind of a switch and bait and uh, have you order more expensive items. So uh, it, depending on uh, where we are in the level of restaurant uh, restaurants from, uh, from quick service to fine dining, quick service wants you to order the, uh, the bundles, but the fine dining would rather you order from the menu. All right, and then we've got different ways of marking up uh, uh, our items. The, the, the most common one is percentage markup, and uh, uh, that's where we just go ahead and say we want to have a 30% food cost, and we uh, mark everything up by uh, uh, 70%, and it's easy to teach the staff. It's easy to do. You know, you just take your costs and you divide it by your, uh, your percentage, and, and it gives you the selling price of the items. But the thing that it doesn't do is it... Uh, it it doesn't take into consideration that we've got items like steaks where they're very expensive. You know, a, st a chicken dish may only cost us $3. So if you were to divide that by 30, you're going to get, you know, less than $10. But a steak dish may cost us $12. And when you divide that by 30, it goes up to $40. So uh, it, it's, it's very, very expensive. And it doesn't take in consideration the flow through dollars. So we may, on that chicken dish, we may uh, bring home $7.00. But on that uh, uh, steak dish, because we're just looking at percentages, we're going to bring in uh, $30. And, and a $30 markup on an item for a guest is extremely high. We, shouldn't, we should determine what we want to make per guest and then uh, uh, work accordingly. So if we were to bring in $10 of flow-through dollars, uh, so uh, basically our selling price minus the cost of our item per guest, then uh, we... we we will be profitable. And we don't focus on the food cost numbers as much, but we focus on our contribution margin. A contribution margin is actually the selling price minus food cost. So uh, doing that, we're going to go ahead and uh, uh, our steaks are going to be more palatable. So if we were to say that we wanted to make uh, $10 off of every steak and, uh, and uh, we had a $12 steak, it would be, we would charge $22. 
and uh, and and that's a different way to look at it, and it, it actually makes items a little bit more palatable when they're high cost items. Some restaurants will use a combination of these two, and uh, on their uh, on their lower cost items, they uh, uh, like on their salads and soups and drinks, they'll use percentage markup. But then on their high dollar items, steaks and seafood and even wine, they'll use contribution margin. All right, so let's just look at the difference of these three. If we were just to focus on food costs with three, these three menu items, so let's just kind of look at this first. The selling price of item A is $10.95 and the cost is uh, $3.50. So we have the lowest food cost on this item with 32%. So if our goal is food cost, we want all items to look like item A. If our goal is contribution margin, we want all items to look like item C where uh, our cost is $12.50, but we're selling it for almost $27, but we have a very high food cost, 47%. All right, but here's what I want you to think about. If you were to look at the contribution margin, and you were to serve 100 people in that day, and you served everybody item A, you would have $745 of uh, contribution money. If you served everybody item C, you would have $1,400. So your, your, your contribution margin would almost be double. You would bring in twice as much money per guest, even though your food cost is higher. So that's why we shouldn't simply focus on food cost. We should focus on contribution margin as well, because we'll make mistakes that, uh, that, that cost us uh, money uh, and flow through dollars if we just focus on food cost. All right, so to design a menu uh, or to evaluate menus, uh, the most common aspects of menu engineering are to look at two variables, profitability, which is either food cost or contribution margin, and popularity. And I would argue that contribution margin is more important than food cost uh, based on my history. And popularity is how many items do we sell based on the total amount of items uh, sold in our operation. So how many hamburgers do we sell compared to uh, all of the items that we sell? Um, so the first person to, to develop this concept was Miller and uh, he used food costs and uh, he used these winners, marginals, and losers. And I'm just telling you this, this is not going to, you don't need to know how to calculate uh, from the Miller model. And the reason why is because this Menu engineering model, which is Casavana and Smith, is the commonplace one. This is the one that everybody uses with the plow horses, the stars, the dogs, and the puzzles. You may have seen this in other classes, or you may see it in future classes. Or uh, if you uh, were to get a textbook on menu engineering or menu evaluation, this is what you're going to see. So let's just look at this one real quick. We have stars. That's where we want everything to be. The thing about these, the me this menu... Uh, uh, engineering model is it's based on averages so since it's based on averages everything can't be a star you have to have items above and below that that the 70 percent line and the average contribution mark <clears throat> so you're always going to have plow horses you're always going to have dogs you're always going to have puzzles and you're always going to have stars on a menu the goal is is to make changes to menu items so that they move towards that star area now, of course, uh, if you improve every menu item and you do it, everything's going to be better. But because it's based on averages, um, you're still going to have items that are not stars. So we're just continuously improving our, our, our operation. All right. So this is what we would do in theory is we would go ahead and take all of our menu items and we would uh, expand them so that we can go ahead and see how many we sold. Column B is popularity. And we would want to see uh, what our uh, item contribution margin is, and that's column F. And then we would determine if uh, the contribution margin was low or high, and if the, if the uh, uh, sales percentage was low or high, and we would classify them. So as an example, the tuna salad is low in contribution margin, and it's low in sales, so it's a dog. Um, the, the fried chicken is high on both, and it's a star. So this would be the math that we do to determine uh, if it's a high contribution margin item or a low contribution margin item, and if it's high or low on the, prop, uh, the popularity. All right, so what would we do if we have a plow horse, which is low in contribution margin, so we don't make a whole lot of money on it, but everybody likes it? Well, one, one thing to do is to increase the price of, of it, and possibly in stages. Um, 
the other thing which I wouldn't do is locate relocate to a low menu profile. If we did that, then it becomes a dog and we want to get rid of it. What we want to do is we want to find a way to maintain the popularity but increase our contribution margin. So what, I, what, what some people would do with this is, let's say this was a hamburger and fries. Well, we could pull the fries out uh, off and just make it a hamburger and then uh, decrease the price, but not quite as much as by the French fries so that we have a high contribution margin. Another thing we could do is we could change the portion size. I don't like changing portion sizes because uh, they insult me as a consumer when uh, somebody reduces a portion size on me. So I would, I would rather uh, either increase the price or change the item just a little bit uh, so that the, the cost is, is, is lower. And by that I mean by removing sides or something. All right, and then we have a puzzle. This one uh, we, we make a lot of money on. We have a high contribution margin, but we don't sell a lot. So the goal is, is somehow to increase the popularity. And we can do that by, by promoting it with table tents. We can do that by having the service do suggested selling. We can do that by uh, uh, re decreasing the price a little bit. Or we can even use that sweet spot on the menu we talked about. We can go ahead and reposition this in that sweet spot in the menu. One thing we didn't talk about on the menu is uh, Privacy and recency. Privacy and recency is a, 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 a reality that we remember the first and last things more than anything else, just as uh, human nature. So as an example, if you use uh, your radio to wake up, uh, the first song you hear in the morning, if you like it or not, sometimes is in your head all day. Or if you're driving to school and you have a uh, 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 serious radio on, the last song you hear might be in your head all day. Um, all those songs in the middle just kind of kind of blend together. So when we talk about repositioning, we can go ahead and make it the first or the last uh, menu item in a section, and, uh, and that will actually increase uh, 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 our consumer's uh, awareness of it. All right, and then we have stars. I'm going to tell you this is what uh, uh, everybody says uh, to do. I go by my dad's philosophy. He says if it's it's not broken don't fix it if we've got a star I would do nothing to it I would leave it exactly where it is on the menu I would not change the price unless I had to go ahead and increase prices on all my menu items and I would not do anything to try to improve something that's already good and then finally we have dogs I can tell you that there's only one reason or two reasons why I would keep a dog on my menu and that's if it is something that kind of defines me as a concept uh, as an example, let's say that I, I have a restaurant that, that, that's known for exotic uh, proteins. And this is an elk dish. It's an elk burger. But nobody really orders this elk burger much. Well, I may keep it on there just to have the elk on the menu. Um, I'm, I would actually, just so you know, I would try to change, uh, find a different menu item that I could use elk in that other people would order. But until then, I would keep this on there just because it kind of defines me as a concept. Any other reason, I would get rid of it. Okay, so dogs we just want to get rid of. Okay, and that's it. Thank you.